John 17, 1 through 3. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Dear fellow redeemed, we worship Jesus. Just let that sink in. I want you to feel and experience the weight of that reality that we worship Jesus, but at the same time see that as the very foundation that you stand on. Everything you hope for, hope to be, your loved ones, whatever, is all tied into that absolute reality of Jesus. And we worship Jesus. Now there have been places in this world where you admit to that, you practice that, you'll be killed. There are still places in this world that you will be killed for worshiping Jesus. Notice this difference. We don't just admire Jesus for who he is and what he did and what he came to accomplish. We don't just follow Jesus or swear an allegiance to Jesus. We worship him. We worship him. We worship him as the eternal, uncreated, omnipotent, all-wise, creator, sustainer, God of the universe who has redeemed us. We recognize him as God, one with the Father, one with the Holy Spirit, three distinct persons, yet one God. There's absolutely no way to be spiritual outside of Jesus. It it doesn't happen. You're not going to be. It doesn't exist. You are either right now worshiping Jesus as you live in this moment and in this life, or you are blaspheming against Jesus, the true God. A person is either going to spend eternity in the amazing and awe-striking presence worshiping Jesus, or they're going to spend eternity in hell blaspheming apart from Jesus. You want to get that one figured out quick, where you're going to be, who you're going to worship. There's nothing more important in this life than knowing Jesus and knowing what he's done for you. This is what the Apostle Paul was stressing so hard to the, to the church in Colossae, to the Christians there. He didn't want anyone to come in there and mislead them about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. He doesn't want us misled either. That's why the Holy Spirit preserved these words that he moved Paul to write. Jesus is just way too important to be wrong about or ignorant, ignorant about. So in this text, what you have, and, and we'll read it coming up here in, in Colossians 1, 15 through 23, but what you have in this text is one of the most complete, profound, and amazing descriptions of who Jesus is. This is absolutely deep theology. It is. Yet at the same time, the Apostle Paul takes this deep theology and he shows it how it affects you and it affects your life and how it applies to you right now in your life as you're living. The work of Jesus, the work of the gospel, it changes us. It changes you. It moves you from being outside of God, lost in darkness, estranged from him, moves you into God's family, into the light, into his kingdom, into worshiping him. You move from a slave to sin to a very loved child of God. So when it comes to Jesus, and we've got to be absolutely clear, when it comes to Jesus, there is no middle ground. You cannot ride the fence. You can't stand in the doorway. You're either there with him or you're there outside of him. Paul is putting this in front of us. He's spelling it out. Now, you never want to miss this. You never want to miss this. Jesus came to you first. The all-powerful God that he is came to you and called you and brought you to him. He calls all people. He came to save us, to deliver us. So let's take some time this morning to dive into this incredibly all-important subject, a subject that I know we want to spend time on, and that subject is Jesus. You can find it in your bulletin. It's from the book of Colossians, chapter 1, starting in 15. The he is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him 
all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things of earth or things of heaven, by making peace through his blood he shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So far, the very words of our God, they are true. They are perfect words of God, spoken so long ago, written so long ago through the Apostle Paul, but inspired and preserved and saved for us to this very day, at this very moment. That's why we can never meditate on them enough. We can never study them, yet we want to always be careful, praying that the Holy Spirit move us and strengthen us through these soul-sustaining words, then that God would bless us with his goodness. We pray, sanctify us by your truth, O Lord. Your word is truth. Amen. So, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, we've got Paul. Paul writes, the congregation, he is rejoicing in them. He's rejoicing that the gospel is in their hearts, that the gospel is taking effect. He's saying, I have seen or heard of the fruits of faith that were produced in you by the gospel. In fact, everybody knows. All of Christendom has heard this. Has heard this. He told them that I am praying for you and I will continue to pray for you in Christ. That you will grow in the knowledge of the Lord's will and power and that he will strengthen you and enable you to do so. That's great stuff. That's great. Now, what follows then in these verses, what it means to us, is an absolutely incomparable way of telling us about Jesus and who he is, how he is God, God Almighty. Now, you're going to see, you, maybe you thought about this as we read through this, maybe you've read through this in a devotion, heard other sermons and devotionals, and there's been a couple things that jumped out at you, and you said, I kind of struggled with this. There's a couple thoughts presented here that, you know, I scratch my head, I'm having a hard time wrestling with that's the case we're going to look into this but i want you to realize nothing here presented is anything to trip you up rather they are incredible truths to embrace to embrace all the more so let's let's start right away let's look at verse 15 right off the bat paul is saying this he's talking about jesus and he's saying jesus he is the very image of the invisible god the firstborn of all creation now some have taken this and they've said firstborn of all creation does that mean jesus was created is that what this is saying well let's 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 look into this first things first though jesus is the image of the invisible god this this is beautiful you see jesus you see god he prayed that on the uh the night monday thursday in the text john 17 you see that all over john jesus saying get to know me get to know the father in heaven So he's not talking about hair color or complexion. He's talking about as you get to know Jesus, you begin to know God the Father. Now, firstborn of all creation. Let's look at that. In biblical times, in those cultures, Old Testament, New Testament, in those cultures, firstborn was a term of preeminence and dignity in a family. This is a well-supported biblical fact. It's all over the Bible. Let's take a couple examples. Psalm 89, 27, God is speaking about David. He says this, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Or in Genesis 49, 3, the firstborn son was considered the greatest showing of the strength of his father, the figure. 
in the text, an elderly Jacob in Genesis 49 is blessing his sons, his 12 sons. Here he's speaking to Reuben, his firstborn son, and this is what he says. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor and excelling in power, 49.3. So we're seeing it as a term used, a term used. Here, used to show the strength of the father. Also, as you know from those cultures, if you were the firstborn son, you received double inheritance. That means you got the land, you got the status, you got the position in society. If the father would unexpectedly die, the firstborn son would become head of the household. So here's what Paul is not saying. Keyword here, not saying. He is not saying that Jesus is one of the many created things. That God the Father created Jesus. He is not saying that Jesus is the first created being or essence and then other things came through him. Rather, what the Apostle Paul is saying is he's borrowing from a well-known term and understanding of that time. And he's saying Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Meaning Jesus has all prestige, all status, all power, all rights, all authority. He's all God. And he will go on to explain that even more clearly through the rest of these verses. For instance, he follows up saying Jesus is the firstborn of creation with this. For by him, that is Jesus, all things were created. Now, the key here, if you're into the Greek language, is the word for in the English. It's at the beginning, it's used to explain things. Basically, Paul is saying, I am now going to explain to you something about Jesus. Jesus is firstborn over all creation. He has the highest status because everything that exists came from Jesus. That's what Paul's telling us. What it ultimately means then, if you have any power of any kind, if you have any authority, if you have any talent, any wisdom, any beauty, any love in you, you have Christ to thank for that. Christ gave that to you. Not only that, Christ gave you those gifts, those blessings to serve, to serve your fellow man, and to reflect and shine the love and glory of God. Also, we are accountable to God. In every way and in everything, we are accountable to God Almighty. So if Paul was trying to say that Jesus was simply created as all things, he would not name him as the creator of all things. And this, again, is an absolute biblical reality. Think of John. Holy Spirit moved John to write the Gospel of John, John 1, 3. Without him, that is Jesus... Nothing was made that was made. So here we have is a wonderful truth. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our Maker. We were created by Christ. This should intensify. This should intensify our trust and our obedience and our worship of him. Now Paul goes on. He's going on. He continues here. He says this next thing. Jesus is before all things, and in him all things are held together. He holds the very fabric of reality. This is profound. Jesus is the glue of existence. Without Jesus, it all comes apart. It all comes apart. Paul then proceeds to say in verse 18, and again, that he is Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead, so that everything he might have, he might have supremacy. Now the Apostle Paul is moving our attention to the resurrection. He's saying that Jesus is the first to rise. Now, again, don't confuse this. Don't confuse this with Lazarus or the widow's son at name or the daughter of Jehiris. Don't confuse this to Elijah raising the widow Zipporah's son. They would be resurrected and they would go on to die. They would die again. Jesus, as firstborn, is being not numerically named, but being put again in front of us as the greatest and the highest. And again, a scripture truth is given to us. Christ's resurrection is so amazing and so powerful. On the third day when he took back his life, his body changed. Unlike these previous resurrected people who would go on to die, Jesus is glorified. He's supreme over all of creation. His resurrection gives our resurrection meaning. He is the first, and we follow in that. On the last day when we rise, we won't be raised as this, but we'll be raised glorified. 
And if this just isn't a powerful enough exposition on the, the might and the supremacy of Jesus, if this hasn't blown you away, wait till you get to verse 19. Here is where Paul puts it all right in. 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. In the bulletin outline, if you see it, I, I just took the Greek word, I put it there, pleroma. It means fullness, fullness. This is so astonishing. You see the claim that Paul is making about Jesus? He's saying that Jesus is all God. He's all God. He's not part of God. He's not a portion of God. He's not a little God, not mostly God. He's all God. He's all God. God isn't a cake that you cut in three pieces. One third, here's the God, Holy Spirit. One third, here's the God, the Father. One third, here's the God, Jesus. No, all the Godness is in Jesus totally. Now just hold that. You're not going to be able to understand it. You know, don't, don't try to break this out in a mathematical formula or some kind of uh, breakdown. It's just not going to happen. It's beyond us. Thank God we're not called to understand God. We're called to believe. Blessed are they that are baptized and believe they'll be saved. So in Jesus, in that tiny baby in the manger, in that man who went around and preached the good news and performed the miracles, in that man who hung on the cross, you have the full Godhead dwelling, and yet you have full man dwelling at the same time. This is a profound and amazing mystery of God. Through this, Paul then goes on saying, through his blood he pays the debt of our sin. This is the substitution I was talking about at the beginning of the service. Through his perfect life, we are given his perfect life through what he did on the cross. He took our punishment. He took the abandonment, the forsakenness from God so we don't have to, so we can be reconnected to the Father in heaven. Wow. Profound and amazing. Now, unfortunately, one of the laws of the universe, it's kind of like the law of the universe, if, if you want to lose weight and you work out, it won't happen, but if you work out to get fit, you might lose weight kind of thing. One of those laws in the universe is that we, we just get used to something that we start filtering it out. Very sad when it happens in marriage. It's so used to all the wonderful, loving things your spouse does for you, and you just kind of take it for granted. You don't notice it until it's gone. It happens in all kinds of things. It happens in scenery. Say you go somewhere, you move somewhere, and you're stunned. What, what is it that does it for you? Is it ocean coastline? Is it high mountains with snow-capped peaks? Is it green and lush forces? Whatever it is at first, you're like, wow, this is amazing. Every day I get to wake up and see this. But, you know, time goes on. You just kind of get up. You're like, eh, yeah, yeah, they're there. They're great. I love them. We get used to it. We filter it. We, we tune it out. We take it for granted. May God help us never to take Jesus for granted. To start filtering them out. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, amazing God. Great, great. What's going on today? We don't want to get there. Rather, we want to take notice of this, this supremacy. Verse 18. So that in everything he might have the supremacy. Jesus is he's, he's too powerful. He's too powerful to push away. To walk away from. He's too massive to come into your life and just be part of your life. He's too huge for that. He's too huge for that. When Jesus enters your heart, when faith is created, you realize something. Jesus isn't part of your life. Jesus is your life. It's never going to be the same from here on out. It's going to be different. When Jesus comes into your life, everything is completely and totally reordered. It's reordered through him. Imagine you have a glass of water and somebody drops a huge stone in there. Not so big it breaks the glass, but it drops into the water the water is completely shuffled around. It's reorganized around the stone. Jesus is that rock. He comes into your life. He reorganizes everything. Now, if Jesus was just a good teacher. Uh, he was a wise and learned moral professor, a wonderful moral, moral example of who he should be, a leader, a president type. He couldn't command your whole life. You could say, Jesus, not here. This is my life. This is the part of my life. Know you. You've got this, you've got this, but we're not going there. There would be things off the table to Jesus. But what we have in Jesus is Paul has been 
putting out so wonderfully in this text is his absolute supremacy over everything and over us as individuals. There's nothing off the table. There's nothing out of his reach. There's nothing out of bounds for him. And we've got to be honest here. We want it that way. We don't want anything in our life that isn't touched by Jesus or goes away from Jesus. If we're holding on to that, we've got problems. And we want Jesus to take that and get rid of that. So think of it this way. In Jesus, you never lack. You never lack in Jesus. This is a point that the Bible makes over and over and over and that Paul is stressing. There's nothing better than having your life built on Jesus and completely reorganized by Jesus. This is a good thing. There's no pleasure so satisfying, no, G- no joy so deep, no love so lasting as that of Jesus Christ. Heaven would be nothing without God. I know some people get this idea that, oh, heaven, I'm going to be bored, right? Harps and clouds. So God... <laughs> What's he do? Gives us field trips to hell to break up the monotony? No, absolutely not. Think of everything that is truly lovely, truly wonderful, truly beautiful, truly satisfying, truly joy-bringing. Think of that without sin. You have that in heaven. You have that because you'll be with God, his unending, wonderful presence. So we have to ask ourselves, as Paul is really challenging in a way, what, what in life is better than Jesus? What am I holding on to at the expense of him? You can't know the supreme ruler if he's not supreme in your life, if you're holding on to something else in your heart above him. If Jesus is God, he can't come into your life and supplement you to give you a boost, to get you past wherever you are, to, to, to give you an extra moral push. Jesus comes into your life to fill it, to fill your life. He's told us this so many times, Matthew 12, 30. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. You're either for me or against me. No offense, Roddy. Now, the Apostle Paul goes through and then he, he dives into the ultimate and wonderful reality of when Jesus fills us. And I want to end by reading the last portion of the text again as Paul puts that in front of us. Here's what the supreme Jesus means to you and all people. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you've heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. In his name we pray. You may rise.